So good morning, everyone. I think we can start uh, our workshop for today. Welcome to all of you who are already present. My name is Sara Peters, and uh, with my colleague Elena van der Leep, I'm sharing this uh, workshop on behalf of the European Burden of Disease Network. And today we're focusing on how we're strengthening the collaboration for national studies of burden of disease of COVID-19. Uh, the program for today uh, is an exciting lineup of uh, four presentations. We're, we'll start with um, some, a presentation on the methodology to estimate the burden of COVID-19. And then we'll move on to, to and this is by Grant Viper from, the public, from Public Health of Scotland. Then we'll move on to some examples of burden of COVID-19 national studies by Annalene Wengler from the Robert Koch Institute in Germany. Uh, third presentation is by Jose Peñalvo from the uh, Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, and he is going to be talking about a European project to unravel data uh, for response of COVID-19. And then we'll finalize with myself uh, talking about our work within the Burden of Disease Network um, on building capacity for national studies. And these are the moderators for today. So as I explained, Elena van der Leep and myself are going to be sharing this session. And Elena will do the um, moderation in between presentations. You're probably used to it by now, but we will have uh, the option, you will have the option of writing questions in our Q&A uh, mode. And we encourage you to write as many questions possible to any of the speakers, please just um, write the speaker to whom the question is directed. Uh, and then Elena will read these questions out loud in um, between the presentations and we'll also have a, a discussion session in the end of the of the workshop after the four presentations. In the interest of time, so we don't uh, run late in the workshop, we'll only allow one or two session questions in between presentations, but then we can also save them uh, for the end for the discussions. And as I've mentioned, we are chairing this workshop on behalf of the European Burden of Disease Network, which is a cost action that has been launched in 2019. We've been having a number of workshops at the conference and you'll hear more about it um, today. But if you're interested, you can also already now go to the website or use the Q code on the slide uh, to learn more about the network. Elena, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody also from myself and uh, I'm Elena von der Lippe from Robert Koch Institute and I will moderate the session. Uh, as Sarah said, we will have uh, after each presentation, which is about uh, maximum 12 minutes, we will have, we will allow one to two questions and then hopefully if the time allows, we will have uh, at the end after all four presentations, also a small discussion if needed. So the first presenter today is Grant Viper. Please, Grant, the floor is, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah and Elena, for the introductions and welcome to all participants. I'm Grant Viper, a Public Health Intelligence Advisor from Public Health Scotland, and I'm here today to give an overview of the methods which we've established for estimating disability adjusted life years due to COVID-19, thus allowing COVID-19 to be integrated into national assessments alongside other causes of disease, infection and injury. The methods which I will discuss, uh, as previously mentioned, have been developed in a European-wide collaboration within our European Burden of Disease Network. So to start off, I would First, I'd like to qualify what we mean when we talk about burden of disease assessment, as this may mean very different things to different people. We are interested in the concept of disability adjusted life years, known in shorthand as DALIs, which many of you may already be familiar with. So DALIs are a summary measure of population health that incorporate both the impact of morbidity and mortality. And for morbidity, this is made by taking into account both the frequency and severity of health conditions to estimate years lived by disability, also known as YLD for short. For mortality, years of life lost, or shorthand YLL, are estimated by taking into account the frequency of death and age upon which death occurs, 
and recognises the fact that deaths at younger ages have a higher public health impact. Dalis are estimated by adding YLD and YLL together, and they give us an estimate of the full healthy years lost due to living with and dying from causes of disease and injury. And doing this allows comparisons to be made across both causes of morbidity and mortality and health conditions which cause both morbidity and mortality, which makes DALIs a very useful indicator to inform debates around informing public health priorities. The infographic I've included here shows how DALIs accumulate for individuals across the life course. And from this, you could probably hypothesize what you might expect to see from COVID-19, that being short durations of YLD, but occurring at a high population level frequency. And finally, is DALIs uh, an indicator of the health gap between the current health status compared to a counterfactual scenario of aspirational levels of health. So the early pandemic context became clear quickly. Deaths were quickly accumulating and it became apparent that as COVID-19 began to spread, it was looking likely that it was going to be a leading cause of death in both the individual country and international contexts. And some attempts emerged and continue to emerge to treat COVID-19 differently through the release of both myths and disinformation. And there were suggestions that those that were dying of COVID-19 were going to die soon anyway. And tell you straight this, people were using life expectancy at birth to frame the remaining life years for elderly patients. However, from living to say 80 years old, you've avoided mortality hazards up to that point and therefore are expected to live for potentially over a decade or more in some specific country contexts. Some of these messages were widely shared and continue to be widely shared, but many have now been debunked, which underscore both the importance of methodological rigor and effective knowledge translation strategies. Through establishing COVID-19 as a cause uh, of infection in bird of disease studies, that allows standardized comparisons with other causes and as a start to segment both the direct and indirect harms throughout the pandemic. Another advantage of integrating it into the cause list is by putting things in a burden of disease framework, the methods have been established for uh, close to 30 years and much, much longer for YLL calculations. And therefore, are not just trying to uh, be cherry picked to fit an, a certain narrative. So I'm going to discuss the three key actions which we've taken over the last 18 months or so regarding COVID-19 burden of disease assessment within our network. We firstly developed a consensus uh, method for estimating YLL for COVID-19 in response to these early misinformation attempts. And secondly, we sought to develop methods for establishing more comprehensive burden of disease, that being DALIs in a two-step process. The first involved publishing methods in a peer-reviewed journal for additional scientific rigor. And secondly, to meet the wider needs of our network members, we developed a comprehensive protocol to help build capacity for national level assessments. Thirdly, although this has been ongoing since the emergence of the pandemic, we've been compiling a repository of burden of disease related research papers for COVID-19 on our Burden EU website. So estimating COVID-19 while it was topical and continues to be topical, as it was important to dispel myths over while calculations and in particular to highlight the importance of transparency and documentation of methods choices, since while assessments are very sensitive to change. For example, you can get very different results depending on whether aspirational or national life expectancies are used in calculations, which you'll hear more about in the next presentation. We published a commentary in the International Journal of Public Health to talk about some of these issues and advocate for this method, methods transparency. For example, life expectancies can always be some, subject to some form of criticism. Uh, there's opposition to using aspirational standards, which usually cite that life expectancy is too variable are not representative for certain countries. However, many within country life expectancies are also highly variable, but it's less common or would be seen as uh, ethically unacceptable to have stratified subnational approaches. 
for say different regions of a, a, a certain country. And in addition, in 2020, COVID-19 presented us with a paradox in that most countries observed increasing mortality risks that led to reduced life expectancies for 2020. And this would have resulted in lower estimates of YLL as the deemed value of life would have appeared to be decreased. So from this work, we have some recommendations. Firstly, using an aspirational life table such as that from the GBD study can avoid the paradox of YLL decreasing when deaths are increased. And similarly, there are ethical advantages to doing this and that the value of life is the same both within and across countries of the world. A commentary was cited for this point in the World Health Organization's SAGE policy document for prioritising vaccination in the scenario of limited supplies. It's also a comparative advantage that YLL and therefore DALI estimates can be more easily compared due to using similar methods. And this is an important point for COVID-19 given it's a global pandemic. A final point is that many countries have sought to adjust to YLL since COVID-19 has occurred in people that have been perceived to have a higher risk of death than average. We would advise that any adjustments would be highly selective as they're not routinely ap applied for other diseases. The, major the majority of people that die are doing so because they have a higher risk of death than average. And if this is carried out, all cause I YLL estimates in particular would suffer as it would result in a loss of focus for the factors and the environments which are responsible for bringing about increased mortality risks in the first place, such as would be the case for risk factor attributable burdens. So some months into the pandemic, many of our members were starting to think about calculating COVID-19 DALIs. Looking to build upon our YLL recommendations, a larger group convened to discuss and establish health states and data inputs. We developed a consensus model and a paper which has been subsequently published in the International Journal of Public Health. The work discusses the issues of uncertainty related to data inputs, given that the availability and quality of data inputs are likely to vary substantially by country. <laughs> this outcome tree summarises our consensus modelling approach to estimating DALIs due to COVID-19. For YLL, eh, sorry, YLD, we consider stratified severities which range from mild and moderate to hospitalised cases requiring intensive care deemed as critical. And we also allow for the estimation of post-acute consequences such as post-viral fatigue. For now, we don't include any other long COVID health states, but as evidence and transition probabilities and durations emerge, then the outcome tree can be adapted to reflect those. It's also important to note that it depends on the type of burden of disease study that you're carrying out. If you're carrying out an outcome-based uh, prevalence approach, then many of these long COVID states will be captured in increased uh, cause-specific non-communicable disease prevalence. So in tandem with a published paper, we also developed a protocol to assist with estimations. And this has been led by Dr. Sarah Perez and has been published in the Burden EU website for some time now. Where this differs from the consensus model and adds value is that there's a wider discussion on the data requirements for some of the information uh, from case studies for countries that have already performed uh, these types of burden, burden of disease assessments. And additionally, it talks more widely about the requirements and resources needed to undertake burden of disease assessments and uh, thinks about strategies about how results and findings can be communicated in effective ways. We would encourage anyone wishing to undertake an, an assessment or who wants to share experiences of having undertook an assessment to email or network. So as I mentioned before, over the course of the pandemic, we've been collating a repository of preprint and published papers on COVID-19 burden of disease assessment as they became available. And we log these on the European Burden of Disease Network website. 
At present, there are 22 peer-reviewed papers relating to COVID-19 DALIs, and two of which are the methods papers which I've described previously. Thanks to everyone for listening. Uh, I'll pass over to Dr. Annalene Wengler now, who will focus on some of the findings from the country-level assessments in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grant. Thanks. Um, I would allow for one or maximum two questions. There is uh, already one in the chat related to the deaths um, uh, to COVID. Some uh, deaths are confirmed and some not. And do you recommend to measure that uncertainty around that estimate? So you will see from the next presentation that there are certain strategies, but of course some uh, that this is not uncommon and is a is was already the case for deaths such as other lower respiratory infection conditions and it's not not a new issue it's just in the light of covid uh, within within scotland we we used two definitions uh, to frame uh, our estimates within a range so we looked at the can the the deaths that uh, were confirmed with covid or the wider definition the wider definition included uh, deaths which were confirmed or suspected with COVID and they, they could have been anywhere on the causal chain of the death certificate. So uh, yeah, that, that, this, the, the, the DALI's guide, which I, I covered there, talks about some of these issues. Uh, and I think just going back to the point, and it's been a theme throughout many of our workshops here, is that the importance of just documenting exactly which have been done uh, so that you know which which results can be compared against each other. Thanks, Romana. Thank you. Thank you. OK, the next speaker is Annalena Wengler, and she will talk about the burden of uh, disease of COVID in some European countries. Please. Um, Annaline, Annaline uh, if you can hear me, you're muted. Thank you. This yes, that was me. <laughs> okay, um, so my name is Annaline Wengler. I'm part of the German National Burden of Disease Study Burden 2020 here at Robert Koch Institute. Um, and I will give a, a, a very quick overview of um, some results that have been found in the different countries carrying out burden of disease studies due to COVID-19. <clears throat> so um, most of you are aware, but I still put it up here again, uh, just a very brief background. Uh, we have around 250 million cases of COVID-19 up to now, um, 42 million of those are in Europe, 5 million deaths worldwide, and um, 880,000 of those in Europe. So it's a relevant um, topic, we're all aware. Burden of disease measures are an appropriate measure for monitoring the pandemic. We have already heard um, a bit about this um, um, in Grant's presentation, but we will also see a bit more about this uh, now. And in general, of course, a harmonization of methods across the different European countries or even across uh, more countries is desirable, but um, obviously the data in the different countries might differ and the methodology often also depends on the orientation of the national burden of disease studies. So it is a bit um, tricky sometimes to find the right way maybe. In general, or at least as I am aware of, four countries have published data on burden of disease of COVID-19 so far. Um, that are the Netherlands, Scotland, Germany and Malta. And I put up um, um, a, a table here from presentation um, um, of Scott McDonald in the Netherlands and colleagues. And um, <clears throat> it actually gives a quite nice overview of um, the DALI per 100,000 people of COVID-19 in the year 2020 mainly. Malta has a bit of longer time uh, um, sphere. And we already see quite a divergent picture. So we see quite high DALIs in the Netherlands and Scotland with more than 1,500 DALI per 100,000 people in the population. But we see lower numbers in Malta and um, even in Germany. Um, but 
there already one methodological uh, problem or not problem, but differentiation um, comes up because in Germany we calculated the years of life lost um, by using our own national life expectancy. But we did actually a recalculation for this um, paper um, with the GDD um, 2019 life expectancy as Netherlands and Scotland in their national studies have done. And then our DALI goes up to about uh, 552 DALI per 100,000 people in the population. So it's still quite a large amount lower than the ones measured in Scotland or the Netherlands. So we already see um, quite a divergent picture here. Um, I also wanted to quickly introduce you to this publication, which has, I think, just been published last week. <clears throat> and it um, deals with the uh, effects of COVID-19 um, um, on, on life expectancy, which I actually find quite interesting and which already Grant has mentioned earlier. But it also compares the wild else of COVID-19 to other diseases. But for here, for in this table, in this um, figure, actually, they looked at the excess wild L in 2020. And here again, we see that uh, Scotland and the Netherlands have a larger excess, for example, than uh, Germany does. Small is not in the picture here. But we also see that there are other countries which have even larger excess well else in 2020. And of course, also countries which have lower or even no excess. In general, when looking at the DALI, um, um, you might recall from the table, or I can just quickly go back, um, that actually most of the DALI is uh, composed of the YLL. So only about one, two, or five percent in Malta of the, y of the DALI is uh, due to YLD. So the rest is actually YL. <clears throat> so if we would want to look at the wild elves uh, in the life course, or not in the life course, but across age groups, then we would actually see that most wild elves are caused in the age group um, 80 to 89, for men a bit earlier, even 70 to 79. This is a German figure, but I would expect that it actually looks the same in, in almost all countries. And But looking at it relatively, um, while L per 100,000 people in the population, we actually see a steep decrease, the increase all over the age groups. <clears throat> and we see a similar picture actually in the Netherlands. And here you see the DALI, but as I said earlier, uh, the DALI is mainly, at least um, in the higher age groups, uh, the YLs. We actually see the same on the left, you see the, the absolute numbers of DALI, and on the right hand again, the DALI per 100,000 across the age groups. But quite interesting here in that figure, I think, is also that for, uh, for um, younger age groups, or so until age of 30, 35, we actually see larger shares of wild bees <clears throat> as part of the DALI. So that's actually quite interesting as well. Here I compared numbers from Malta and, um, and Germany, and um, I, I went about <laughs> um, actually comparing the wild bee per in per infected person and the wild L per deceased person. Uh, first, the wild D actually look quite, uh, quite the same for Malta and Germany. So um, it is a relatively um, small share and that probably has to do with some methodological issues as well because um, for now COVID is only measured on a very short time or it, the wild year only depends on a very, very short time that is measured. We do not take into account any long-term effects um, as long COVID, et cetera, yet. So that might actually change later. But we see quite a similar picture in Malta in Germany. But if you want to look at the um, YLL, you actually see a different picture again. <clears throat> in Malta, about 15.8 um, years of life are lost with each COVID-19 death, whereas in Germany, it's only 10.4 a while L. <clears throat> so we already see, okay, there's also a differentiation between the countries. Um, then another example, looking at the DALI um, from a different angle, and which I actually found quite interesting as well, and we're planning to do something similar in the um, national burden, in our national burden study, um, as we already, and we already did that for the YLL overall, but not for the COVID YLL, so that was a good hint. But uh, here you see the DALI by area deprivation, so that I think is quite an interesting picture, and, and that is um, uh, of a very large public health relevance because we see cl clearly that in more deprived areas, uh, we actually um, see quite higher values with regard to COVID-19. 
that <clears throat> should be targeted, of course, by public health authorities. And in the Netherlands, we also have also found a very nice uh, picture looking at the DALIs, the COVID-19 DALIs by occupational status. That is something we in Germany could not be doing because we do not have that kind of information. But we, um, and we see quite nicely, actually, that, of course, in the, the group um, um, without jobs, so the not applicable, that are people that are already retired or um, are in job search or maybe are still students, are the highest group because, of course, uh, older people are more affected than younger people. But um, putting that aside, we actually see that uh, health, the healthcare sector is most vulnerable. So we are here we see quite a larger number of DALIs caused by COVID-19. So quite an interesting um, anal analysis as well, I think. So in summary, we can say that um, burn of disease indicators are very well informative for evaluating the effect of COVID-19 on population health. Um, Grant has already stated so, but we've seen that in the results more now. Um, but there are some methodological and uh, data difference between the countries. <clears throat> we also see that up to now, at least YLL contributed most to the valley, and I think that probably will um, persist to some degree. But um, as we further take into account long COVID and other things, it actually might at least switch not switch, but change a bit, and the YLD part might become bigger in the, in the future, we will see. And of course, it's a continuously relevant disease and cause of death and will be for a while, um, um, sadly, but um, all these long-term effects, of course, need to be monitored. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Annalene, for this interesting presentation. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, or is there one? Um, yes, just to thank you that it's a nice overview of the existing studies uh, in Europe, um, but I don't see any particular question. So maybe we just proceed to the next presentation and see if uh, any other questions come up uh, at the wrap-up discussion. Um, so I will give the floor to Jose Penalvo, who will talk about unraveling data for rapid evidence-based response to COVID um, and will tell us about the Uncover project. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks to, to the chair, to Sara Pires and Elena <clears throat> von der Lieb for for the invitation to, to present uh, Uncover, uh, the Uncovered Network, uh, which uh, I believe is a, is a very good example and a success story uh, of the flexibility of the European Burden Network, uh, the European Burden of Disease Network, uh, to create additional collaborative actions. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Peñalo, and together with my, with my team at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, I coordinate Uncovered which is a coordinated uh, support action that was funded last year by the European Commission in one of the uh, urgent calls to, to address COVID. Uh, Uncover was born uh, last year uh, from the interest of initial members of the network to use the breadth of the information that is still being gathered and accumulated at hospitals uh, as a result of the, of the ongoing pandemic. Uh, we define ourselves as a functional network of partners capable of collecting and utilizing real-world data derived from the response and provision of care to COVID-19 patients uh, by the health systems across Europe and, and elsewhere. Um, the network uh, was finally composed of 29 partner institutions, mostly hospitals uh, across Europe and also in some of the countries outside of Europe. And many of them participating, as I, as I mentioned before, also actively in the European Burden of, the, of Disease Network. We are a total of 29 partners. Uh, out of them, um, about 80% are data providers or hospitals providing data to the network and a smaller percentage, about 17%, providing 
analytical uh, expertise and capabilities. Uh, you can see in this slide the um, distribution of countries represented in the in the network, uh, mostly from Europe, also uh, countries in the such as the UK, South Korea, uh, Colombia, Brazil, and the USA are also represented. <clears throat> So the objectives of the um, network um, are mostly uh, focused on bringing together uh, both data and, and expertise in Europe and internationally uh, so that we can monitor, identify, and facilitate the access uh, to COVID-19 related real world data, mostly real world data. We also have some um, uh, research data available to us, but it's mostly uh, data coming from electronic health records. We try to identify data gaps uh, and particularly in marginalized population and try to find synergies with complementing and existing uh, clinical databases. We are attempting to provide a platform for the use of uh, different data sources uh, that are able also to streamline um, ethical requirements and legal requirements on the use of this, of this data. Also a big part of our activities revolve around uh, broadcasting our activities and, and uh, yeah, streamline the findings that we are uh, achieving with the platform in different um, um, stakeholder meetings. We are as in uh, most EC funded uh, research structure in work packages that we also uh, structure in, in blocks uh, according to the activity. Uh, we have a first block on the definition, design, and data harvesting, comprising the most technical work packages. We have a block number two on the analytical de the development and, and demonstration of the case studies. And the block number three, which is most, mostly related with project management and, and the broadcasting that I, that I mentioned. For the data uh, identification, we have uh, 16 databases of, databases of electronic medical records from 10 different countries, six national registries, four observational cohorts, and two data sets on population screening. At least we have two time points of data collection, uh, at least admission and, and discharge, but many other databases containing also information during the, the stay of the patient. And of course, we have a, a variety of um, types of data from demographics to uh, epi data, uh, contact tracing, uh, mental health, et cetera. Uh, one of the major uh, activities under Uncover is to document um, all the data processing activities that we do. And that um, implies uh, a thorough uh, characterization of the data, the, the origin of the data, the use of the data, whether the data has consent uh, from the patients or not, <clears throat> uh, whether the, the data has been collected under uh, ethical approvals, identification of the data protection officers, uh, a, big, uh, a big amount of activities related to uh, characterizing the, the, the complexity of the legal aspects of the data. The World Package 3 on data harmonization, we opted to develop a federated learning uh, infrastructure using machine uh, learning procedures uh, with the goal of creating uh, models uh, that can account for the complexity of, of the data while keeping um, compliant with the GDPR and other international regulations. In this sense, the, the data available to uncover remains locked in their servers at the hospital level and it, only the algorithms and predictive models are traveling between the different databases. We are using uh, Opal 4.2 as, uh, sorry, 4.1 as our preferred software and an interface for, for analysis that is uh, based on data shield. Uh, once this um, infrastructure is created, which is uh, almost that uh, we are at the end of the first year of Uncover for a total of two years, uh, we are now working in defining the case studies and the first uh, research questions we want to go through the, uh, the platform. And for that, now the analytical team is uh, working in um, creating the scripts and the necessary, um, yeah technicalities 
and to assess questions mostly based on understanding better um, the characteristics of vulnerable population in terms of uh, COVID infection, the underlying drivers of COVID-19 prognosis, the safety and effectiveness of treatments and potential, uh, potential long-term effects, as well as the impact of COVID-19 in the health systems and, and in population resources. We have um, also different channels for communication. We are quite active in Twitter uh, and LinkedIn. We have a web page already providing a lot of information and uh, a YouTube channel where we post our trainings and our seminars uh, for uh, public uh, reference. So I, I encourage you to, to look into these links if you, if you want to have more information about Ankara. And finally, the last package is on coordination. <clears throat> uh, we also put a lot of effort in um, placing Uncover um, um, in a framework that is very well uh, coordinated with other projects doing similar things in, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, for example, the Orchestra project or Syncros or Dragon, all these projects are uh, collaborating with um, uh, we don't cover in streamlining all the, all the findings. We have assembled a external advisory board, data protections and ethic advisory board, and a societal and regulatory advisory board that are pretty much linked to our daily activities. And we also have some internal structure to make um, this large, large network of, of partners um, working together uh, smoothly. And this is all for me. As I as I mentioned, we are finalizing the first year, which was on preparation of the of the project, and we are approaching the the, the start of the of the analysis. So hopefully, uh, next time we we meet, I can give you some information about case examples and the results coming from from this platform. But thank you all. Thank you, Jose, for this uh, nice uh, overview of the project. Um, it's definitely very interesting to next time to see the results from a project. Um, yes, um, there are no questions at the moment from the audience. I don't see any. Um, Brecht has published the again the link to the site uh, of the project. Thank you and. Um, the contacts are uh, still visible from your presentation, so anybody who um, has uh, later any questions can pose them, but um, feel free. We have still time till the end of our workshop where we can uh, still um, manage several questions at the end, so please feel free to um, post also later some questions. So I will give now the floor to the next speaker, uh, to Sara Pires, who will be talking about building country level capacity to estimate the burden of COVID-19. Please. This is technical support, Sara, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, um, and thank you, Gisela. Uh, so as, as Elena just mentioned, I'll be talking about our efforts within the European Burden of Disease Network to build capacity and support each other for uh, national studies of, of the burden of COVID-19. Uh, to give you a bit of context, so this is work we're doing under the network, as I just mentioned, which is a cost actually was established in 2019, and by now we have around 270 members from, from 50, 50 countries from across Europe. And this picture was actually taken in um, February 2020 at one of our annual meetings. And right at this time, the pandemic was hitting already Europe. So it was a big topic of the conversation uh, while we were having the meeting. And we had brief discussions at the time saying, maybe this will be relevant to estimate the burden of COVID-19 in our countries at some point in time. We also didn't know what the extent and the impact of the pandemic would be at that time. 
Within the network, we're actually having, uh, we're divided in, in, in five working groups. Uh, so three of these are thematic working groups and, and two are more cross-cutting, cr cross focusing on methodologies and knowledge translation. But like, I would like to focus here on working group two, which is focused on infectious diseases and also working group uh, four on, on methodologies, which are the most relevant for what we're covering here today, the methodology and capacity building to support, uh, to estimate burden of COVID-19. So when the pandemic hit, and now we all know, we all know that we're focusing on COVID-19, we, we didn't know much about the disease, but we've been learning in the process. It is caused by a SARS coronavirus, now called SARS-CoV-2, and it was declared as a pandemic in March 2020, as I mentioned, just briefly after uh, our annual meeting at the time. And we've been learning that it does have a high public health impact globally, so there's no doubts about this. What we could see as an opportunity was to estimate this impact in different countries in a harmonized metric so that we could then compare these impacts across countries and help our policymakers guiding in some of, some of, of the important decisions also. So COVID-19 did look, feel like a practical, a perfect practical case to contribute of, to all the aims of the European Burden of Disease Network. So we have two groups of aims within the network, research coordination objectives and building capacity objectives. So we basically focused on uh, a number of points to reach these objectives when focusing on, on COVID-19. As uh, Grant mentioned earlier in his talk, we sat down a number of us within the network to develop and harmonize methodologies, develop the disease model, including identifying the relevant health outcomes, defining the data requirements for a national COVID-19 burden study, and also had discussions in the, about how the optimal computation for these models would look like. And then focusing on bu building capacity, which is also one of the main pillars um, of the of the network, we uh, we focused on activities to build capacity, on actual calculations, and also for knowledge translation. And what we see in general in the network is that we usually at very different places in different countries in terms of level of development for burden of disease studies. COVID-19 was a special example because we felt that we were all sitting on the same place. So we were all just get wanting or um, taking steps to get started in our national studies and had to start from scratch in terms of develop, defining the data requirements, collecting data and so on. So we took this opportunity and um, one of the, the overall main activities uh, within the network was to establish a task force to support each other uh, to calculate the burden of COVID-19. And this task force, which has been running now for, I believe, over a year, has a number of specific objectives. We want to share experiences, the ones of us that are already running uh, COVID studies, and you've heard some of the results uh, early on by and in the presentation by Annaline. We want to support each other in these calculations, overcoming challenges, taking decisions on to overcome data gaps and so on. We also want to apply harmonized methodologies and, uh, and also for the communication of results to make sure that we can compare and, and make overall um, conclusions across Europe. And we also want to discuss our results and, and challenges again uh, within, the, within the task force. Grant also mentioned one of our first activities within the task force, which was to develop the protocol for country studies. And this has been published in our website already for a while. It has also been published afterwards as a, as a scientific publication. And here we provide very classical, very uh, pragmatic guidance to estimate COVID-19 in the burden of COVID-19 in each country. So you could almost look at it as, we call it a protocol. It feels like a, a cookbook. Other activities that we're running within the Burden of COVID-19 Task Force, which is, by the way, open to all members within our network, and the network itself is open to anyone that wants to join. We have regular um, 
overall task force meetings where one of us would present recent work or discuss challenges and then also we follow an agenda to discuss medical um, methodological considerations, data requirements and methodologies to overcome challenges and so on. We also have ad hoc meetings with individual countries to give more practical support and to look together at different challenges and, and, and support in the calculations. We've also established a sub working group that is focusing on long COVID-19. The challenges here are different because most of the epidemiological evidence and the data itself is still accumulating and there's a number of countries including members of our network that are conducting are running very large um, epidemiological studies and we're we're following these step by step so we can also understand how we can integrate this uh, data in the future in our disease model for COVID-19. We have established an online discussion forum, which is very practical. Anyone can go in and write a question and then the ones that have registered for the forum will also receive a notification of the question and everybody can answer. It's almost like a chat function where we can support each other uh, very quickly. And the output of these, all of these discussions and work within the task force is that we have seen several studies launched. So um, Annalene, share the results of the studies that have been launched and already have results that have been published and there's another uh, a series of others that are also ongoing and again the strength here is that we're helping each other in these studies and we're also all use, using harmonized approaches to derive comparable estimates. So I will not go back to the estimates that uh, Annalene shared, but this is just to give you an overview of studies that have been published already. And these are here in the table in bold and marked target color in the map and other examples. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm missing others, but at least from the task force countries that are um, running uh, efforts right now and some some just being launched and others about to to publish so we we think in the near future we'll have a very good overview of comparable DALIs, ylls and ylds for all these countries across europe just to wrap up other activities that we've run within the network and of course these are also linked with the covid 19 task force we had two public webinars focusing on methodology um, to estimate the burden of COVID-19. And we had an, a, a very high number of participants of an, an interest on those webinars. One of the webinars was also conducted um, in collaboration with the Uncover project. As I mentioned, everybody is welcome to join the European Burden of Disease Network and, and also the um, the COVID-19 task force and you can write to us using one of these emails. Again, what you can expect from, from our shared work uh, within the task force is to share experiences for calculations of COVID-19 burden in, in your countries and very practical support with the calculations, decisions for the modeling, including assumptions and um, and strategies to overcome data gaps, which we all have in, in our countries. By using harmonized methodologies and aligning strategies for communication, we can also make sure that we have um, comparable message across our countries. And another important thing that we're doing, at least seeing from the researcher's perspective, is that we're discussing ideas, needs, and priorities for, for upcoming research projects uh, on the burden of COVID-19 including for, uh, for long, uh, long COVID. So again, you're welcome to join our network. You can see some of the information again here and, and just write to us if you have any other question or comment. And thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Um, there is uh, one question in the chat that I see, which uh, basically can answer um, almost uh, each of the presenters. It refers to the methodology. Um, how does your method for assessing YLD for COVID relate to the IHME method, methods? Do they apply the same data and methods regarding these uh, records? So feel free, whoever from you wants to answer, I think uh, almost 
all of you can do this. Grant, maybe you would like to address this question. Yes, uh, can everyone hear my mic? Okay, okay. Uh, so, so yes, thanks for the question. Uh, so in terms of uh, the methods which uh, for assessing YLD and YLL, uh, as Annalene had showed, uh, there's sometimes some important reasons why countries may uh, want to adopt their own methodology. But in terms of the kind of YLL uh, methodology paper, that is pretty much in line with the way that the GBD would advocate. I think what one of the key reasons that I had uh, already covered was that given it's a global pandemic there might be an increased need for international comparisons. I believe the, the IHME uh, method from what I have saw and what's already been kind of shared in social media the disease model looks pretty much the same as ours and I think in this instance uh, because IHME have clearly been uh, doing a lot of COVID work but uh, the GBD study within itself has been put back uh, from its initial timelines and in this case the National Burden of Disease studies have been able to be a bit more reactive and I think with the increased uh, exposure to health information uh, and appetite for policymakers to uh, use this information we've had a uh, Give a lot better infection access to infection data than we've ever had uh, before. So I think, in some ways, we are a bit ahead of the curve. Maybe I can add to this. Um, at least we in Germany have compared the reported cases of deaths uh, for in the German system and the ones that uh, IHME is estimating for Germany. And there is almost 50% more cases than we report in Germany. So there are quite a lot of inconsistencies and um, discussions which is right and which is wrong. And um, uh, there is uh, unfortunately not much transparency how uh, they come up with these numbers. Um, so, but there is not really um, officially published DALIS yet. So we um, we cannot uh, check for the while these um, consistencies, but they def there are definitely, at least for the results for Germany, consistent differences with the IHME data. Annalene, I don't know if you want to to add something to this. No, I think I'd, I'd just just very briefly, as Grant said. So in general, the methodology does not uh, is the same. So for calculating a COVID nineteen um, YLL is the same as calculating a YLL for ischemic heart disease, for example. So there, we at least in Germany are very close to what IHME is doing. Just that we're applying a different life expectancy. And um, for us, our data source is different since we do not have it in the death register yet, but we um, actually use the notifiable cases. So that might be a different. Thank you. Um, there is also another comment uh, in the audience for the efforts that we are putting on the COVID uh, burden of disease estimates. And uh, there is a question if uh, there would be also a Europe wide paper on disease burden. Um, this is a very interesting question. <laughs> Maybe I can take that one. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting question and an interesting uh, perspective. We're certainly going to compare our estimates from the national studies and compile them and um, make an overview of all the output from the national studies we're conducting and put that out in the world as soon as possible. Maybe we should mention only that we are still elaborating on how is the best way to uh, capture the long the effect of long COVID. So we are still uh, wor working on some methodological issues, and uh, hopefully, when we have enough data about it and enough um, con concise information, maybe we can proceed to also such paper. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, please, somebody correct me if I 
uh, miss something. Otherwise, I uh, wish everybody still a uh, nice time on the conference and um, I hope sincerely that uh, the burden of COVID for us researchers also will decrease in the next years and that we will uh, be able finally to see each other face to face. Next time we are the hosts uh, in Berlin. So we hope really that um, after such workshop, uh, after such presentation, we will have the possibility also to have a lunch together or drink coffee together and uh, talk about any future aspects of um, burden of disease estimates. Thank you very much for the participation. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.